Welcome back from lunch. Hope it was delicious. Maybe some tacos. I don't know. It's San Diego. We had a great time. You're in for another great talk on yet another IoT hack by uh, Joshua uh, Meyer, right? Meyer. By Joshua Meyer. Thank you. Please, everyone, give a, ra a warm round of applause to Joshua and welcome him, Torcon. <laughs> Alrighty, thanks everyone. Um, so I guess let's dive right in. So a little bit about me, I work at uh, Independent Security Evaluators. We do custom white box security assessments. We look at all kinds of things and we have a particular focus with media entertainment industry and we also have a large um, research presence. I guess I skip that a little bit. So I just have a couple slides here and basically we're just gonna lay the uh, groundwork for what we're doing today, and then we're going to do a live demonstration of looking at this device here. Sure. Is this better? We had to move it back. <laughs> Try. Hello? Better? All right. <clears throat> so we're looking at the TerraMaster F2420. I got the specs here for you, but it's basically a pretty run-of-the-mill network attached storage device that you might find in small homes and businesses and that kind of thing. Um, it's got a web application. It has a nice bird on it. Um, pretty typical. It's, it's one of those desktop metaphor web applications, so they're kind of neat. Um, it's got all kinds of little services it can run, and a lot of them are running by default. Um, we've got your file sharing stuff, and we've got some telnet and SSH and that type of thing. And that's all I got, so let's go ahead and roll into the, actually checking out this device. And I've got the login page up here. So we'll go ahead and sign in. And as, as you saw on my screenshot, this is kind of what you get. So, like I said, it's your desktop metaphor. You can you got your icons and all that good stuff. Yeah, strange permission errors. Surprise, it doesn't work. <laughs> we have folders and that kind of thing. Um, so we've got all kinds of little neat little features inside the control panel, and this is where you're you're going to have your administration type functions. You're going to have like creating users, making folders, groups, that kind of thing. And these are exactly the types of actions that we look for when we're assessing these embedded devices because they tend to just be wrappers for um, commands and functions that run on the operating system level. So they tend to be prone to command injection and we can go from there. So in particular, we've got something like creating a user. So while I'm using this web application, I'm also proxying this through Burp Suite, which is a uh, web proxy software. And maybe I didn't proxy it very well. Let's see. Okay. All right. So we can um, go ahead and we'll try to create a user and we'll see what this request looks like. Oh boy, I didn't clear out my data. Shame for me. All right, so that was a little sneak preview. There's lots of vulnerabilities in this device. I guess it didn't get cleared properly when we reset it. Um, okay, so we'll do something a little different, I guess. Um, so we'll try to create a user, and we'll give it a username. We'll, we'll call it, I don't know, Torcon. And we'll give it a very secure password. And what's wrong? So that's done. Oh so, of course, payloads are going to go through. I apologize for this. It gets better. Hang on. <laughs> Oops. Have that 
channel. Okay, I apologize. I did not have the logging turned on. Fun devices. All right, try that again. All right, so here's the actual request we wanna look at. So when we create a user, do you guys see that okay? That's very small, isn't that? Is that a little better? Um, that's a pretty typical looking HTTP request. Um, we can see our username and we can see our password we put in here. Um, so it turns out that when we create these users, it's just getting passed to a command line argument, some sort of utility on the operating system. And this user input is just being passed to it directly. There's no sanitization, so we can do our classic exploits. We can do I don't know, let's try to create a file. And so we'll make a file in temp and we'll call it torcom2. And we'll close off that. And operation successful. So if this attack worked, then we should see a file created, created in temp. So we can switch to a terminal, and this I can make big. And I believe we have SSH on it, so we'll use the admin account that we already have. And the IP address. Action refused, oh boy. Um, this is one that's on 922. Okay, so we have a shell now, and we can look into slash temp, and our command didn't work, oh boy. Oh, because I didn't do a path, right? One more time. And there we can see the file that was created through the command injection and user creation. So this is a very typical endpoint that we found in our research on all these devices. We've got devices of all kinds of classes and they all seem to have these problems in common. So moving on from that, and we can go back here and clear out some of these awful cross-site scripting payloads. Um, it's gonna be a little problematic. Let's delete the old ones, that sounds like a good idea. But uh, <laughs> as I'm sure you were all very astute, you can see that there's going to be cross-site scripting in these shared folder names as well. So what happens when you make a folder name? We can go back into Burp Suite and we'll see what kind of request was generated there. Looks like this one. 
And again, we've got this similar looking request where we've got the folder name and I didn't give it a description, so that's blank, but we've got some various things here. But we think there's gonna be cross-site scripting in here, so we can try doing a payload here. Um, we're gonna use a, I'm gonna type it in here so I can get the URL encoded version for it. We're gonna do a classic image tag. We're gonna give it a file name that probably isn't on the uh, web directory. And then when there's an error, we're going to pop up an alert box with, uh, I don't know, 64. We're going to URL encode this so that way it fits in the post body of our request. We're gonna head back here. Operation successful. And then if we refresh this page, hey, there we go, we got cross-site scripted. So again, we've got these very basic vul web vulnerabilities, and it, it, these device, this is a, a fairly modern device, I believe. Um, just your very typical run-of-the-mill vulnerabilities. So we could continue going like this for hours of just clicking in all of these forms and finding wherever they, they come up at. But an easier way to expedite this tends to be to look at the source code for the application. And if we notice up top, we can see a .php extension in the URL. So it's probably a PHP application. So we can head back to our shell here, and we can look and try and find where these PHP files are. And there's a whole lot of them, but. It looks like they're in user dub dub dub, so. Something else worth mentioning here is that we cannot get root, so. We have a low privilege shell here even though we're an admin. So at some point we're gonna wanna get a root shell so we can have full control over the thing. But heading back here, we can see our PHP files. This looks like a web root directory. So we're gonna wanna take this web root directory and send it to our own machine so that way we can do our own offline analysis of, of what these source code files are. So I'm gonna go ahead and tar up this um, directory here. We'll call it, I don't know, files.tar. All right, and then in our home directory, we should have this nice uh, tar file, tarball here. So at this point, we're gonna head back to my, my local uh, console here. And I think we can use SCP to get this thing off. Mm, let me get this full path here, actually just to make sure it's right. All Does SCP take that argument? Maybe it doesn't. All right. 
Well, luckily I have this copy I've already created before. <laughs> so, just so I don't have to go click through the web directory and try to find this thing. Save some time. But I've got, oh, actually we can't do this. Never mind. We'll have to use some time then. So let's get back into this thing. And we're going to have to find out where the um, shared folders are for this device. So I believe they are usually Let's try that. Right. CP files. Let's do slash mount. Pub. All right. I think that'll work. So now we should be able to go to the file manager and find them. I don't have permission to do this. This is unfortunate. Does anyone offhand know what the flag for SCP is to use a different port? Capital P? No good. After the colon, you do it? Oh, in front of it, okay. That sounds right. Ah. Success, 10 points. All right, so now we've got our, our tarball here and we can proceed with the rest of this. So now I've got my local copy here. Again, um, we just took off user slash user slash dub 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 because that's where we found the web application. So let's go ahead and start taking a look at these files and see if there's anything good. So, I don't know, includes a good choice. So here we've got some PHP files. Let's try upload.php. Yikes, that doesn't look like PHP. Hmm, well. Data. So what, what's going on here is it turns out that this, these PHP files have been obfuscated in some way. Perhaps they were encrypted. Um, at any rate, we know that PHP is a, a, scripted, a, a scripting language, so it's interpreted. So these, these files should be in, in human readable form at some point. Um, so, let, so let's run with this idea that they're encrypted. What might be decrypting these files? Um, how about the PHP interpreter? That seems like a good guess. So we'll head back into our uh, SSH session here. And we will find out where the PHP interpreter lives. Looks like user sbin. And then we'll go ahead and we'll do a similar thing and extract it. So now we've got our PHP binary. So at this point, we have this 
PHP binary, we have these encrypted files. Um, we're going to take a guess and say that these, these files are encrypted using symmetric encryption, so that way the, the, you know, there's a key that's already known and they can decrypt these files as needed. So this device seems to be able to do this by itself. So that means there's probably a key floating around somewhere where we can find this decryption key. So we're going to look inside the PHP binary. Of course, it's a binary, so we're going to have to use something like Binary Ninja or Ida Pro or something like that, some disassembler to look inside the binary. So now we've, let's see if I can make this bigger. That's not quite the same thing, but we, we've got the binary open now in Binary Ninja, and we think it's going to be a symmetric encryption thing, so what, what's a standard symmetric encryption algorithm? Anyone? AES. AES, good choice. All right, so we're gonna look for the AES function. There's several of them here. Uh, the, most of them don't look very interesting, and you probably can't see any of them. But the last one is called Screw AES, which is kind of interesting. So, <laughs> so we've got this little function here, and I can try to make this. Work. It's you know assembly, so this no one really wants to read this, but we're looking for a key. So in theory, Binary Ninja will just show it right next to us. Well, we don't see one in this function, but we do see over here that it is cross-referenced by another function, which means that something is calling this screw AES function. And it looks like it's in the middle of this. And so let's go back up to where it was originally used. And oh, what's this? So is this our key? Probably but it looks like it's used just before an MD5 function. So we think we may have found our key inside this PHP binary that's using this thing called screw AES. So we can head back to our terminal now and split off of this. So at this point, we need to MD5, that key, and then we need to use some sort of decryption routine to decrypt all these PHP files for us. So with the help of some of my good colleagues here at IAC, we came up with this nice command, which will take this uh, string that we have, it'll MD5 sum it, clean it up a little bit, and put it inside a, uh, a hexadecimal encoding. And the reason we want it in a hexadecimal encoding is so that we can use it with the OpenSSL utility, and then we're just gonna use that to go ahead and decrypt all these PHP files. So that's the first step, and then the second step is to use, ooh, looks like it went all by itself. Let me bring that up again. But we have this nice find command here. I had a fun day learning how find works, but we're going to look for all of the PHP files, and then we're going to run this command here. And we're, we're just going to make some assumptions here, so that's why we saw a bunch of decrypt errors when I ran this. Uh, but we're assuming it's just going to be AES-256 with CBC mode, because that seems like a typical choice. We're also assuming down here that the initialization, initialization vector is zero. So we're going to have some uh, errors on the first block because of this. 
But the good news is if we look now, we have these files that end in .dec.php. And if we look at upload again, hopefully it will be in plain text. And it is. So we see this error at the top of the page, or this bad block at the top of the page, but that's okay. Because we can see now that we've got all our, our good old PHP code in here. I always like the die function. All right. So now we've got the application source code. And again, the idea is we're just trying to find a whole bunch of vulnerabilities very quickly. So what we can do from here is we're going to look for problematic PHP functions. Something like exec, which calls system processes, would be a good choice for that. So we're going to recursively grep through this uh, web root, and we're going to look for exec. So there's a whole bunch of results. And I'm being a little loose here, but eh, let's try using the, this parenthesis. Do we need to escape that? Yeah. All right. So how many results did we find? 724 instances of exec. So that's a lot. So potentially each and every one of those could be vulnerable to some sort of command injection vulnerability. Now a lot of them probably aren't. And Again, maybe my search was not as precise as it could have been, but just to give an estimate of how many times shell commands are being called by this uh, web application. So we can go back to our list here, and I have ahead of time identified a problematic uh, function, and it is resides within include class plugs.class. So again, we've got our decryption thing here, but this is a, a, a PHP uh, class, I suppose, um, plugs. And we can look through here and this can go to the top. But we do see exec appears in here several times. Here it's making a directory. Here it's running some command. I wonder what that could be. All kinds of things. All right. But one of the interesting ones that I found is a function called log total. So we can take a quick look at this. It's pretty small. It looks like it takes in two parameters, one called table and one called type. And it looks like it's doing something with SQL. We see here some SQL statements being prepared. And it looks like the way they choose to run them is down here. I don't think this decrypted correctly. Oh, right here. OK, 825. So here we see that it's calling the SQLite 3 binary on the operating system, and it's providing it with the SQL command. So looking at this, we can identify that there's a possibility for SQL injection and there's probably a possibility for command injection. So SQL injection tends to be tedious to test for, but we can probably find a command injection. So let's see where this log uh, total function is being used. So again, we're gonna go ahead and search through our files here, and we're gonna look for underscore log total. And it looks like it be is used by log table. So again, we'll look through here. 
first thing we want to point out is right here on line two, it looks like it's setting this variable called data, and it's using the values of your post request. So that's important to note. And then we'll go ahead and we'll try to find out where uh, log total is used. Turns out it's used way down here at the bottom. And it looks like we're looking to make sure that you send a post request, and in there, there is a parameter called tab, and it's set to get total. And if that's the case, it's going to use this plug function, and it's going to run, or it's going to run the log total function from plugs. And it's going to provide it with the, a, a post parameter called table, the value of it, and the value of a post parameter called event. So what just happened here? We just found a, a page where it's taking user input and it's storing it directly into this function down here. We didn't see any sort of sanitization going on here. And we looked in the plugs.php file earlier and we didn't see any sanitation, sanitization there. Um, something else, if you peruse through this file, you also notice that there's no authentication being checked here. So it looks like there might just be this endpoint out here that could give you some good results. So remembering that we need a tab parameter, we need a uh, table and something else. We can use that to build a nice little curl command here that'll make a post request for us, and it'll go ahead and populate these parameters with some things that might be interesting. So first thing I have to do is fix this uh, IP address and port number. Okay, going back here. So for those of you not familiar with curl, um, what we're doing here is we're specifying the, the post body's data. So we're using tab, and remember it was supposed to be get total, so we'll set it to get total. We're sending table, and I have no idea what the, the database table names are, so I'm just gonna try my table and see what happens. And then we've got this event parameter, which is one of those that got passed to the log total function in plugs.php. And we're going to do some back ticks here. And what we're doing here is we're calling user sbin telnet d, and we're giving it hyphen l with the path of bin ssh, bin sh, and we're giving it the port number 12345. So what's this do? This starts a telnet listener, and if you connect to it on port 12345, you should get a shell. So let's go ahead and fire off this request. All right, we got a 200 okay. Did it work? Yeah, it looks like it did. Hey, and we finally got root. So, just, <laughs> just like that. Thank you, thank you. So again, recap, recapping our strategy here, we could spend all day poking around at the web application, but usually the much faster way to do it is to look at the source code. And if we've got something like PHP, it should be pretty easy to look through, and we know what problematic functions are, like exec. So this device was interesting because they were doing that AES thing, but in the end, it didn't matter because they had the key stored in the PHP binary. So we can extract that out and, and decrypt the files. And then we found an endpoint, which was vulnerable to not only command injection, but it also didn't require authentication, and it ended up being root command injection on top of that. So at this point, we have a single curl command that could be applied to any of these Terra Master devices. You don't need authentication. You can get a root shell on them. Effectively, they're now your device. So. If you'll remember from that 
word count list I printed earlier, there was, what, over 700 instances of exec. So who knows how many more of these kinds of endpoints are in the device. Um, so if you want some free CVEs, I highly encourage you to check out those endpoints. But that's, uh, I think that's all I have for you today. Any questions, guys? Comments? All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.